Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today we have the Ernesto Pereira visiting us. Actually, he's today and tomorrow. So if someone later wants to talk to him a little, he will be available. Maybe tomorrow. <coughs> Ernesto is a physicist. He got the degree in physics from the University of La Laguna in the year 1996. And then he got a PhD in neuroscience also from the University of Alabama in 2001. Uh, during the PhD, he was visiting a scientist in the Max Planck Institute for Complex Systems in Dresden in 1999. Uh, about his thesis, he got the, the prize of the Young Scientist Award from, in the area of medicine and health science from the government of the Canary Islands. Uh, since 2002, he is assistant professor in the University of Alabama in the Department of Industrial Engineering. He was before it was, called, it was in the physics department, but uh, after the, the change of everything, he's now in the industrial engineering department. In 2005, he was a visiting scientist in the Austrian Academy of Science in Vienna. And uh, he works mainly in time series analysis. He's uh, one of the experts in time series analysis, uh, especially in using nonlinear methods. But he also works in, in synchronization, he also works in, in general aspect of nonlinear dynamics. So, uh, thank you very much, Ernesto, for being here. My pleasure. Oh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Claudio, and uh, also thank you very much uh, to all of you for attending the, the talk and uh, the Institute for inviting me. As uh, Claudio, uh, to all my uh, Degree is in physics, but after phys after getting the degree in physics, I uh, immediately started working with uh, mm. time series and from experimental uh, <coughs> mainly from neuroscience, uh, the field of uh, EEG, and uh, more recently, uh, magnetic encephalography. And uh, what I mainly try to do is try to understand the behavior of the system, which produce uh, the data. In this case, is uh, the time series and. Uh, trying to understand the uh, relationship between uh, the part of a standard system or system which uh, are correlated. For example, some of the work I've done is a sort of culture where, where uh, people try to understand the relationship between the cardiac frequency, uh, respiration and blood pressure. So I, I just have uh, to give a little bit of th thought about what I was going to present here. Uh, because uh, the field of nonlinear time series analysis and application to dynamical system or uh, natural system, it's a very active field and uh, it's also a relatively wide field with applications in many scientific disciplines. And uh, since it is the possibly the closest uh, thing, uh, uh, if you compare to the analysis of a dynamical system where we know the equations, I decided to go for the assessment of synchronization from time series in reconstructed state states. Just to give you a brief outline of the talk, I'm going to speak briefly about synchronization in dynamical systems. Just briefly because I'm sure most of you are very well acquainted with the concept and the idea uh, of this phenomenon. Then I will talk uh, a little bit more about generalized synchronization, what is it and how to characterize it. Uh, we will be talking about a central concept in the characterization or assessment of the generalized synchronization from time series, which is the concept of conditional neighbors, and how it can be used to uh, create indices of generalized synchronization in the state space based in the cross condition between the two systems, or compare conditional neighborhoods uh, <coughs> between uh, the two systems uh, by comparing the neighborhoods with the rest of the attractor. I will talk also about how to reconstruct the state space from the time series, which is a crucial point without which uh, nothing of this would be applicable to our experimental data. And then I will talk a little bit about some advanced methods uh, uh, with some application, uh, especially how to use bivariate surrogate, which is a, a resampling technique which allows us to uh, test statistically beforehand whether uh, the index we are measuring are actually uh, looking at synchronization or it's just some property of the individual uh, time series that we are measuring and um, how to combine uh, an advanced method of uh, embedding, multivariate embedding with the concept of mutual information 
to produce an uh, index of causality in the state space in a multivariate framework where we have not two but k uh, greater than two uh, time series at the same time. And I will finish with some conclusion, acknowledgement, and some debrief. If any of you have any questions, please feel free to ask during the talk. So, synchronization in dynamical system, I mean, I'm sure most of you are well aware. Uh, this is a very important concept in many scientific disciplines, and I the origins trace back to Christian Huygens in the 17th century, where he was studying the um, synchronization in the pendulum hanging from a wooden beam in his uh, so called lab. And from then on, it has been a very active uh, field of research where uh, the theoretical results on synchronization uh, could be immediately applied to many different disciplines, time series analysis, uh, communication, and all. Okay. Uh, I was doing some research in the recent literature, uh, literature uh, because uh, I somehow I didn't manage to find uh, a good definition of synchronization in a formal way uh, and it seems that it's not that I'm not good at looking in Google but <laughs> that, and in fact it's not so easy to find a good definition formal and unified uh, definition of synchronization although in the next slide I will try to do so uh, well if you have two dynamical systems X and Y uh, synchronization between them is often described as the existence of a given regime between the system or some of the variables. Um, this is a growing list of regimes with new regimes uh, uh, being added from time to time. The first one which is so called identical or complete synchronization, uh, dates back to the 80s. Uh, it's you have two variables of the system and you make the difference, then you have zero, so the, the variables are exactly the same. And it is uh, a very simple one is possibly the simplest, but it requires that the systems are identical and <coughs> completely free of noise, which is uh, in practice, is, uh, I would say, almost impossible even with electronic devices. Uh, another option is late synchronization, where the, we have the synchronization but with certain uh, delay between the two systems. Then we have generalized synchronization, which uh, has uh, received a lot of attention uh, in many experimental fields, especially in neuroscience. Uh, and we will be talking about this uh, during the presentation. We have also phase synchronization, which is a very nice concept. Uh, also uh, has a, very, a lot of application in neuroscience, which is a weaker time of, uh, weak time of synchronization as compared to GS. Uh, and in this case, we only have uh, to find uh, or to have an entrainment of the phases. Uh, uh, so that the difference between the phases of two frequencies of the two systems are bounded with time, although the uh, amplitudes might remain uncorrelated. There's also anticipated synchronization. Actually, Carl is quite an expert. I have published many nice papers on the on this concept, and the list goes and goes. But as you see, this is described only by what we see, and it is not a formal definition. If we try to go for a formal definition, what we can do is first try to observe what are the common points in the list, right? the common things we are uh, finding in all the regimes. And we can uh, <coughs> sketch a small list of common things, which will be as follows. Uh, estimated synchronization requires, first we have to measure some property from the system, which might be whether amplitude, power, uh, phase, or whatever. Then we have to compare these two properties, or these properties in the two system, and this is important. We have to determine whether these properties agree in time, because uh, you know, synchron the word synchronization comes from sync, which means together, and chrons, which is in time. So synchronization means something happening at the same time. Right? From this list of common traits in the regimes I have presented in the former list. We can say that a unified definition of synchronization taking about 
uh, we talk about these ideas, might be as follows. I, I think this is a good one. Two dynamical systems X and Y are synchronized with respect to some properties GX and GY. These are the properties we are measuring. If there is a time independent mapping, a transformation, such that this mapping applied to this function which measure the properties, equal to zero. Okay? For all the trajectories in the same in the space, state space. So a long time we find that there is such a mapping. For instance, in the case of phase synchronization, G would be the phase of a variable with the property we are measuring. The function G would be an estimator of, of the phase. We don't have only one estimator, we can have different estimators of the phase, so this is one of these estimators. And the mapping will be that a natural number times the function, uh, the phase of the X system, minus a non-natural number times the function of the, sorry, the phase of the Y index, minus some constant equals zero. Right? This will be the, this mapping which is presented. This is somehow a formal kind of astro definition, but it can be rephrased, rephrased uh, in a way which is possibly uh, simpler and more uh, easy to apply or easier to apply in the uh, concept of time series so that uh, synchronization might be defined as the occurrence of a statistical relationship between the observables of two systems due to its mutual interaction. So we have statistical relationship, is, we substitute this function by this expression, and the observables will be functions p, and we need this mutual interaction. So this uh, uh, statistical dependence might not have by chance. We have to actually found that the, if something changes in one of the system, uh, equally it changes in the other system because there are some mutual interaction between the systems. But is mutual interaction not very strict in the direction of coupling or not? No. You can have by variety as well. So I mean if you have one system coupled to another one in one direction only, is this covered by this definition? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. Yeah. Because you have I mean mutual interaction means <laughs> Yeah. One is zero and I mean, it's difficult to define because <laughs> okay, okay, fine. Yeah, it's, uh, it covers both un un unidirectional or okay. Okay. I, I, I don't see the equivalence of the two systems. I mean, this is not price. exactly equivalent. This is like a rephrasing which is uh, possibly less abstract. This is a mathematical formulation. This is another way of. Oh, you need an interaction here. You don't need an interaction in the, in the first definition. No, in the first definition, you still have something yeah. that forces that is, two systems. That is, that is, that you only need to have such property, but. Uh, one is possibly it's very difficult to have these things without an interaction. And the second one is more robust against noise. The first one doesn't know. Doesn't yeah, noise. This, is, this is more um, in, no, I'm saying they're in okay, a way of measuring. Sure. No, no, they're not good. But this is possibly more applied to time series because actually uh, a time series is actually uh, an observable which uh, we measure a long time. But you are right that uh, here there, you don't have anything about mutual interaction. The only thing is that the condition is very difficult to fulfill. Unless you have to, I mean, you can possibly. You have, for instance, a linear system uh, of a sinus, sinus wave uh, starting at the same initial condition and the system is linear, you possibly can have this. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. And this is also a good point because possibly this definition without the mutual interaction is somehow not completely okay. Thank you. So for generalized synchronization, which is one of the types we have seen uh, before, uh, it was, to the best of my knowledge, first described by Brulkov in a seminar paper in 1995, PRI, generalized synchronization in unidirectional coupled county system, which is a nice paper. And uh, it, this kind of synchronization has excited special attention in time series because, as we will see, uh, the fingerprint of generalized synchronization in the reconstructed state space is uh, well uh, tailored measured by some indexes which are relatively easy to calculate. Uh, in generalized synchronization, there is a functional relationship between the variables of both systems, so that in most general cases, the variables of one system are a function of that of the other. Uh, it's a general, a rather general type of synchronization which has nice properties for experimental signal. The first one is that it is possible to find it between non-identical systems, which is good. We don't have the need the system to be equal. We can have non-identical system, uh, uh, 
which is mutually interdependent, and uh, still you have this time of synchronization. Uh, it might appear in different coupling configurations. Mm, uh, you can have it in uh, unidirectional coupling, but also uh, bidirectional coupling. And this functional relationship does not need to be linear, it might be nonlinear, complex, and also if you have some noise, the noise, I mean, up to a certain level, uh, does not disrupt the synchronization. Uh, if the state equation are known, general synchronization uh, can be studied using different tools. One of them is the auxiliary system approach, which is a very well known technique. So if you have a master relay configuration and you want to know whether the master is in general synchronization with the slate, you just take a copy of the slate, connect it to the master, and then look at the system of identical synchronization between the two slates. If the two slates are identically synchronized, then there is generalized synchronization between the master and the slate. Okay. But then you need a copy of the linear system, which is normally difficult in the natural system. Yes? Again, the equivalence between these two the definitions is not at all clear, right? They are completely two independent definitions, and it's not clear whether they relate, right? You mean which one? Having a functional relationship and the twin system, auxiliary system approach. No, no, this is a way to look at that. This is not a, def a definition. Well, it, it is a working definition, but it's not congruent with the with the other one. Yeah, I'm. The, I'm yeah, you're right. But I, what I see is that you can try to study this uh, generalized synchronization using this. This is not uh, not a, actually as a definition. This is yeah. Actually, for me, this is more of a definition than the one I've studied. <laughs> <laughs> but you need uh, still you need a, a <coughs> perfect copy of the slate, and this is only for master slate configuration, as far as I know. Because the other one is very restrictive. In many this cases, the file you're even not able to provide it, or it's yeah, yeah. impossible to provide yeah. it. Actually, this is the the yeah, formal definition is difficult to to fulfill in practice. But this is only I would say this only a way to look at this uh, accident. And this is only possible if you can get a copy of the one of the system, which is normally you cannot do it. So. Uh, the, but you're right. And the the second case is studying the conditional Lyapunov of exponents of the combined system, where if the Lyapunov exponent goes, uh, the largest Lyapunov exponent has to be uh, uh, zero or lower than zero, so that the difference between the uh, state variables uh, decreases whenever they, the two variables uh, apart, from, uh, apart from each other. But in these cases, you either may need a copy of the linear system, or you need to know the equation, or a way at least of estimating this conditional Lyapunov exponent, which is uh, non trivial. But what if you don't have the state equation, which is an experimental system with a normal situation? Uh, in these cases, what you have is at most a fi finite noisy time series recorded from one or some of the variables of the system, which you normally cannot access. I mean, you cannot access the system or make any manipulation, you don't have the equation, you only have the time series. So, what can you do? Is it still possible to do? Uh, or or the degree of interdependency that the state space or something similar or something which is related to the generalized synchronization in, uh, uh, from the time series. The key question here, uh, as in most application of dynamical system methods, is that what happens to the system always echoes in the time series. Right? So if you look at or measure a time series of the system, uh, the relationship between the system is somehow uh, also included in the time series. The point, of course, is how you can look at these things. Right? So, if it is so, we can apply a kind of reverse engineer looking at the effect of the synchronization trace back to the cause, which is the origin, which depends on mutual interaction between the system. Right? Uh, and we will see, and this is the main concept which is used in practice to look at the synchronization from time series in the reconstructed state space is that two closed state vectors in the phase space of one system due to the mutual interaction or generalized synchronization are simultaneous to vectors that are also closed in the others. We'll look at this uh, in more details and <coughs> I promise some figures and can make it a little bit more clear. And what, what is more important, <coughs> we'll see how to use this idea to uh, create some indices that allow to assess the, in principle, the relationship 
but in some cases, even you can uh, also look at the directionality or the causality uh, direction of the interaction from one system to the other. Uh, so uh, the phase state of the system, or the natural system we cannot access, we don't have the equation, act as a kind of a meeting point where, for the one hand, we'll have this property here, closeness of the state-to-state uh, -state vectors, and on the other hand, we have the time series that can be used to reconstruct the state -to state So in the state -to state we can do the, uh, the, the trick of looking at uh, the traits of the synchronization and try to measure it even from the time series. Okay, let's see whether this video works. It's a very good example of the Russell system. Uh, if you see, you have the three variables here, and of course they are projected in a trivial manner here. And we have, this is the differential equations, and here you have how the trajectories in the attractor progressively fills state space. And uh, now we will see second system, which is the Lorentz one, uh, which is drive by this, oh, sorry. by this. Okay. So this is the Lorentz system, which is also a three-dimensional uh, continuous uh, nonlinear system. And as you see here, we have a nonlinear dependence or nonlinear uh, coupling with the x two variables of the other system, right? Let's see what happens with the trajectories in both the test space of the Rossler and the Lorentz when there's no coupling first. As you see, systems are completely independent. One is going from one side to the other, and here we have in the fast frequency regime so that uh, there is no uh, relationship with an agadai between one, both of them. And indeed, this is the case because we don't have any kind of uh, synchronization and both systems are completely independent, right? But what happens if we activate the coupling? Then things change. You see, still, they have certain degree of freedom, so the, okay. they are not completely identical, but the states which are close here, also tend to be close in the other. This is due to this strong coupling, nonlinear coupling with the other system. Uh, there's a certain degree of shrinking and stretching of the original attractor, and most importantly, stages which are closer here are also simultaneous with the stages which are close. Yeah, but the problem yeah. of the learned system is it has not yet the typical attractor anymore. So you are forcing so yeah. much. Yeah, I mean, I mean this is a, a toy example that this is very high. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So you are not finding the dynamics of the system. Uh, yeah, the only thing is that if you uh, decrease this value to suppose one or something, uh, with that, so that this uh, behavior is no longer clear to the Nakedai, uh, but you still have some kind of carbon, uh, is there a way you can try to measure it on the statistical point of view? Yes? Sorry, this is a master slave copy. Yes. So the, the roster system should not change its dynamics. Right? I mean, but because it's the initial condition are different, so it's not exactly the same. Ah, yeah. okay. Because I, yeah, you're right. There should be this one. This one should be the same. But I promise that I didn't take the, the same original uh, initial condition. But it is right. I mean, this one should not be. Uh, sorry, this one should not be affected. Perfect. And that's actually uh, one of the ways it, uh, it is used to measure. Uh, the direction of causality because you have information in this system about the other one, but not the other way around. You don't have information in this one about the other. So we have seen the dynamical aspect, but what happens in the state space? Here, this is the original Rossler, and uh, this is the uh, Lorentz with and without coupling. Right. Uh, sorry, uh, it's the other way. This is with coupling, without coupling and with coupling. This is a state vector here, and all the nearest neighbors are the more similar or the closest uh, state space vector uh, here, which are not, uh, at 
the same time that supposedly we start here, then after some time we go back here, then again, and so that the timing or the timing distance for these uh, neighbors uh, are not consecutive, but different in uh, some time. You see the Roxler attractor is quite periodic, uh, so if you have the fundamental frequency, this might be like one, two, or three, four periods. Okay? And then what we have done is use the time indices of these neighbors to find the simultaneous uh, neighbors or the simultaneous uh, vectors in the other state space. Okay? Here is the, the reference vector here is simultaneous with this one. And as you'll see, whereas all those are close to the original because we have actually chosen them this way, the simultaneous vector are spread all over the attract. So the closeness here does not imply closeness there. So there's no conditioning of the closeness here to produce a similar result here. But if we apply uh, some coupling in this case, a strong coupling, what we will see is this, this uh, state space vector, which we are conditioning by the nearest neighbor of this one, actually are now all of them close to the roof. <coughs> so that, in a way, uh, this coupling will have known as that close vector here are also close here. Right? So we, we can try to exploit this idea, this fingerprint of just generalized synchronization or synchronization in general way in the state space, to try to produce some indices that take into account this effect, that closing this, this close uh, vector in one of the state spaces are simultaneous to vector which are also close. Right. This is that the key idea we can try to exploit to uh, produce or to measure synchronization from the states. Okay, but well you can say, yeah, so what? You have this closeness, but can you use it to study uh, generalized synchronization from time series? And actually, uh, it depends on two questions. First, it is possible to assess quantitatively this closeness of the conditional neighbors and decide whether it is not by chance, whether we don't have that uh, vector uh, conditioned by the other one, I just uh, randomly or by chance placed close to the reference vector. And uh, the short answer is yes, although I mean, it's not so simple, but uh, it is possible. And the second question, it is, is it possible to reconstruct the steady space of a dynamical system from this time series? Because if we manage to measure generalized synchronization in the state space, and then we cannot, in a way, reconstruct the state space from the time series, then we uh, are doing only half of the job, and we are not being able to measure uh, synchronization if we don't have the equations, right? Or the, the true uh, state variables. And again, the answer is yes, but again, it's not so simple. Right? So let's see how to do it. One step of a time, first we will look at this, then at this. Then we also see what can go wrong, and we also try to see how not to go astray. Well, the first attempt to derive GS indices use conditional neighbors were based on the idea of cross prediction. The idea is as follows we take a state vector and also the, con the counterpart, the simultaneous vector in the other system. You see, this is the index indicating uh, time, and we take simultaneous vector, right? We find the time indices of the k-nearest neighbors, of the k-nearest neighbors, sorry, of y and k. If you go behind what we are doing, we are looking at the time, uh, the time indices of these neighbors, right? Um, or here, the time indices of And then we try to predict the future of x using the conditioned neighbors of x, which are those neighbors of x conditioned by the uh, behavior of y. Okay? So we just use the information of y to predict the future of x. Right? And then we use the average prediction error normalized to the Rudman square, which is the error we commit when we try to predict using the average or the mean value. Uh, this satisfies this condition. This is, of course, this is one if the prediction we do is not better than 
what we do with the mean, which is basically random, and it is zero if the system are identical and predicting with y is uh, as good as predicting with x. Okay, I don't understand yeah, yeah. what need is making. I understand the concept of a point which is close to another yeah. neighborhood. Um, Near neighborhood will be the, the state vectors which are at the lowest distance in the state space. You just take all the uh, State, state vectors and calculate from each of them, each reference vector, you calculate the Euclidean distance. So, so the uh, one is or whatever <coughs> definition of a norm you can use to measure distance. And you take, suppose, the k state space vector, which are closest to the original, which is, are the more similar states. Right. The point is that uh, they should be similar in, uh, similar in time, so the, the same state should, be at, uh, should happen at similar times in both. Uh, system if they are synchronized. And then, if it is so, then you can try to uh, predict, even if the system is nonlinear, if you go <coughs> only one step ahead, then you will be able to, using the information from Y, you should be able to predict the future behavior of uh, X uh, with an error which is lower than the. Actually, this should be equal here as well. Main analysis, lower and equal to. Uh, so if this is so, we can define another index, which is 1 minus the error, so that this, if it is 0, because the system, uh, the, there is an uh, important degree of information on y about x, so they should be in a way connected, synchronized, uh, and it is, uh, sorry, this is, if this is 0, it's because the error is 1, and then you don't have no information, and here if the, the index is 1, it's because the error is uh, 0, and then you can predict very well, so this is 0 for independence and one as uh, for perfect mapping or complex synchronization, right? And also, one interesting thing is that you can look at the relationship between the errors. So if you have the error of predicting x from y is greater than the error of predicting y from x, this indi indicates you that y has no information of x, whereas x has information of y. So the information goes from x to y, but not the other way around. That would be that was the initial plan, right? Well, unfortunately, I mean, here is uh, an example. This would be the, the original uh, vector x n. You have the evolution, and this will be the prediction, and this one will be the error, right? Uh, unfortunately, the, the indices which were derived using this method have some pitfalls. The first one is that they depend strongly on the prediction strategy. You can find, you can use different strategies to predict, and depending on the strategy you produce the error might change, then it is, doesn't make any sense to have an index which is very much based on the parameters you use to define it, or it's, I mean, not the perfect uh, scenario. <laughs> Another one is that this is index were not very robust against <coughs> measured noise. And uh, another one, which is also subtler, is that this relationship uh, to infer the directionality is also influenced by the largest Yabun of exponent of each individual signal. For example, if you have sorry, each individual uh, dynamical system, if you have two dynamical systems which are uh, weakly connected or not connected at all, and you try to reduce one from the other, you will always find that uh, in the case of one with this large Yabun of exponent, it's harder to predict the future, no matter uh, even if the, uh, you have a bivariate uh, dependence, uh, which is equal in both sense, because uh, for this dynamical prediction into the future, uh, the, the, the features of each individual time, uh, each individual system also constitute that, which is uh, a typical problem in the study of generalized synchronization uh, or any kind of synchronization, but especially this one in the reconstructed state spaces, that if the coupling is weak, the indexes also measures in a way, in some way, some proportion, some properties of the individual signals, not only properties of the communication or synchronization, which is a drop. Okay, so that's it. A strategy is completely false or wrong, that's nothing. Or can we do something? Interestingly, interestingly uh, and I call this the new trick number one. Uh, this concept has seen a recent revival with a paper no less than science, which is quite difficult to find for time series analysis, uh, especially from a concept which has been 
around for a long time. The, the, but uh, this George Sugihara is a well-known ecologist working in ecodynamics, the, the, the dynamics of uh, uh, ecosystem, and has also some experience on linear time series analysis. Produced recently, uh, which is called a convergent cross mapping, and in the literature people already started to call it Sugihara cross. So, what is the difference between the original? Strategy we just reviewed in the previous slide and this Sugihara causality. Uh, they basically make, make two changes. One is a uh, uh, subtle but very clever, and the other one is just changing the, the prediction strategy using a uh, Gaussian curve, which is nothing so special to be honest. The first change is uh, we try to predict the vector instead of the future. So we don't have this prediction of the future behavior, but then you just produce the local neighborhood and try to compare the actual value with the uh, predicted value, but without going one step into the future. How, uh, why is a uh, clever idea what is intelligent? Because the, in this way, you eliminate this dependence with the uh, the exponent of the each individual dynamical system, right? And the second one, which is uh, also an idea that Sugihara has used previously to try to find uh, no linearity in the little time series. It's using a Gaussian kernel so that the predicted value of the the vector, the state space vector, is a weighted average of its condition and neighbor, and the weight is proportional to the exponential of the distance between uh, the original network in the other space and its neighbor. So the, uh, in this way, you take into account all the neighborhoods, but the neighbors which are farther from the uh, from the uh, Simultaneous vector has a much lower weight. So if you have noise interfering with the system and are putting close or not very close, uh, the effect of noise is reduced. That's at least the claim that they offer. So, so this yeah. is changing the, instead of considering just k neighbors, you're considering all the neighbors. But without no, weight actually, you consider k, but the only thing is that you don't, the, the weight of each of them is different. And it is proportional to, I mean, the, the closer you are, the closer my. It's like best friend in Facebook, I think. It would be something like that. Uh, I like with these two improvements, uh, they, on the one hand, they reduce the dependence from the Lyapunov of exponents, so that this uh, dependence in the measuring the causality is reduced, or even uh, eliminated, as they say. And also the effect of noise is reduced. And they claim that this cross-convergent mapping, convergent cross mapping, is a robust indicator of causality in the times and the states. You see, Quite a simple thing, they change, and still they get a science which is amazing. Right? <laughs> but the point is that this is uh, still ongoing. Uh, interestingly, this paper has already got uh, more than 100 citations. Also, it has to do more with the, with the journal than with the paper itself. <laughs> with one of the books is over the yeah? Yeah, possibly. <laughs> I will show you an example later on, uh, very interesting about this uh, thing, this uh, obsession with the uh, number of citations. <laughs> But the latest theoretical results in PRI, in the group uh, and Weigel, indicate that actually it is difficult to consider uh, CCM, you can look at the details here, uh, as a measure of causality. The, the, the index actually is able to detect uh, the happening, but it's difficult to talk about causality. But still, it seems to work well in application, apart from the original application of Sugihara with uh, an uh, ecosystem uh, comparing the uh, population of anchovies and sardines. Uh, there's also a nice paper recently in your image, and there's still been also some work on uh, stock markets to try to infer the effect on certain uh, indexes on the prices of some stock. Just to give you our kind of graphic idea, that is what the CCM do. This is the case in bidirectional causality. We have information from X to Y and from y to, y to X. These are the X system, this is the Y system, and here the close vector of X are projected to close vector of Y. So here, if we want to predict X, we will take 
an average of all these three, but the, those here, which is a little bit more far away, has a lower <coughs> weight of, uh, as compared to this one, which is close. But as you see, we have in both directions from x to y, from y to x, we have uh, closeness in both neighborhoods and uh, low uncertainty, low error in the estimation of the uh, reference statement, right? But if we have asymmetric unidirectional coupling from x to y, then it is difficult. Points here are projected at different points here, so that uh, it is difficult to predict x from y. Sorry, it's difficult to predict y, uh, y from, uh, from x, but the other way around, the uncertainty is lower. So that, uh, in this case, you can uh, differentiate between bidirectional and asymmetric or unidirectional coupling because the uh, prediction error is different in each case. Right? And it, as they said, it, it works fine if you remove this uh, one step ahead prediction, then you can do the rest of things apparently. And this is quite a new result, but it seems to work well in practice. So, uh, on a similar idea, uh, it is also possible not to look at the dynamic of the prediction one step ahead, but only look at the size of the neighborhoods or the topological property of the conditional neighbors and look at the size of the true, the conditional neighborhoods, and the radius of the, <coughs> sorry, the triangles of the state space. Here, if you go to the picture we presented uh, before, this is the case of uh, strong coupling. And we define three different quantities. First one, which is here in green, is the mean Euclidean distance of a reference point to his k nearest neighbor. Just take the average for the k elements of the distance between the original and the neighbors. Then you have <coughs> the average size of the attractor, which is calculating the average distance from xn to the other uh, vector for all the vectors. This is the attractor radius. And we also have the condition. Yeah, conditioned neighborhood, which is in the, I would say, peak, right? Uh, in which you take the neighbors of x, conditioned by the index of the neighbors of y, and then you calculate the average distance between xn and the neighbors that are uh, taking from the information we have in y. So we have actually three measures, <coughs> actual neighborhood, condition the neighborhood and the whole brain. Okay? And then we can try to compare the three of them to produce indices of generalized synchronization. Okay? Those are the first two indexes which were derived. Uh, in the first one they compare, if you remember, this one is the size the true neighborhood, and this is the size of the condition in the neighborhood, right? So that the best case, if the, the signals are identical, this one are equal and this index is one. But <coughs> if this, they are in no relationship, this, uh, the, uh, the pink one tends to be similar to the yellow one, and then this is uh, close to zero, right? So the index is one for identical date, uh, uh, identical system, and goes to zero if there, are, there is no synchronization. Right? Problem with this index is, first of all, it's not robust against noise, and even in the case of independent signals, it is not. Oh, sorry, see, I always talk about it. Uh, even in the case of uh, in independent system, it is not zero, and the value uh, for independent system depends very much on the dimension of each of the individual systems, which is not good. They try to improve it by comparing not the green with the pink, but still the pink with the yellow, which is uh, a little bit more robust. Uh, in this case, if the conditioned neighborhoods are small, so if the pink is similar, more similar to green than to uh, yellow, then this goes uh, close to zero. 
but if this goes similar to the green, then it goes to infinity. This is uh, better. The problem is that it is not normalized. You can have a value as high as infinity. Uh, not infinite, that is, you can have a very high value, and it very much depends on the this size of the initial attractor. So you, you, don't, you cannot say that two systems have an H index of 4. Uh, this is the same meaning that if another system has the same value of A. Uh, just to show you here quickly uh, why these indexes are not so good, uh, especially for indicating the directionality of the interaction. As you will see, for instance, here, you will see that depending on the value of the coupling for the same uh, roster Lorentz configuration, uh, in some cases you got the information right, and in other cases you get the information wrong, and it doesn't seem to be a clear pattern so that very much depends on the value of C. Sometimes you got the information right, sometimes you don't. So they, these indexes are not so good to give you information about the directionality. Uh, there were two, another tries to improve this idea by uh, normalizing the indexes, taking basically a difference between, in this case, this is the yellow one, this is the pink one, and this is again the yellow, so that the index is normalized, and also this M index is normalized, so this is between 0 and 1, this is a good index, but still it is uh, difficult to get information about directionality from these indexes, although this seems to work, to work not so bad. Both are improvements about former indexes, but still too many problems in it. The first one is that for weak couplings, the value of the indexes, especially in the other cases, but also here, uh, cannot be used to infer causality because the more complex system that you have a signal with the higher frequency has always a higher value of the index. So you, you cannot use in principle the information about the, uh, the value to infer causality. And also for short data, it is you can you don't, cannot reconstruct the state space fully and both indexes are greater than zero even without coupling. So that, uh, you can say that this is 0 0.1, then you have coupling, because it could be that actually you don't have, and only you don't have the state space fully reconstructed. Uh, solutions. In the first case, we can apply it what I would call uh, new trick number two, which is an index uh, which try to fix this idea or this problem. And in the second one, we will see how to use uh, the various solutions. Well, the new trick number two, what we do is, if the problem, if you have a system of different uh, dimensionality, one more complex system and another one which is uh, less complex, is that the size of this neighborhood change. Even the closest neighbors, uh, the size is greater with the system more, is more complex because uh, even if you go one step ahead of time, because of this uh, higher complexity or higher point of exponent, a system and the next step, the uh, the state of the system has about um, uh, a higher distance or longer distance along the trajectory because of this higher complexity. So the size of this green neighborhood depends on the, the dynamics. So the idea is simply to normalize it uh, and work with the rank of these distances. We calculate all the distances and. Uh, substitute the value, the actual value of the distance by a number. So I have one preference vector here and suppose four uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, this one is the closest, the second closest, the third closest and the fourth closest. For the first closest I give number one as a distance, for the second number two, the third number three and so on. In this case, or in this way, the size of the green neighborhood is always fixed. K plus 1 divided by 2 is always the same. And if I do uh, the same for the green one, this is also fixed. N divided by 2, this is the average of all possible distances. So the only thing that changes is this, the condition of distance. This is fixed here. And this is also fixed. This is the only thing that changes, so that the directionality or the value of the condition is only governed by the size of the pink one, because the green one and the yellow one is our own system. So you've seen this is uh, it's, uh, quite a clever thing, and uh, the indices 
uh, quite good in detecting the directionality of the information. But of course, the problem is that you have to calculate all the distance and you have to short all the distance because you have to know which one is the first, second, the third, the fourth process to the origin. Yes? And when you do this renormalization yes. between the green and the yellow one, you really observe that the ratio between the two is constant throughout the different. Yeah, because it's by definition. If you have k vectors, the, the, if you give the first one distance one, the second distance two, then by definition you will find half the, the, the average is k, k plus one divided by k. Perceive that you are uh, averaging I mean, one they, plus they, two they plus three. In the green scale, uh, um, exactly. You, what you do is to re rescale the green one and the yellow one so that they are fixed. And only you, you rescale this in the same way. And they scale uh, equally with the dimensionality. Yes, because you are normalizing. The only thing is that you are applying, you have to uh, be sure that the only thing that is changed here. So actually, well, in the next slide, uh, Authors present uh, the difference between x calculated from x to y <coughs> and y to x, which is this is zero, zero here, and so that if the value is positive, indicates from one system to the other, and if the value is negative, is the other way around. And you see that x, h, and m sometimes are not working very well, but if you go to the index L, they detect directionality in a very systematic way, both with and without bounds. Okay. Let me go a little bit quickly. Well, uh, that's good. We can do something uh, with cross uh, prediction or comparing the size of the neighborhood with some uh, careful uh, tricks to normalize distances. but. They will ask the first question, uh, sorry, they will answer the first question, but what happens with the second one? Can we reconstruct the state spaces in the time series? Yes, we can. So, forever, right? <laughs> <laughs> we can use uh, uh, as component of the state vector successive samples of the time series. And this is applying uh, Tarkin theorems, which is a paper in 1981. And uh, I will show you how to how does it work in practice. Just quick reminder, quickly. This paper was published in 1981 as a conference proceeding in a journal. This is lecture notes in mathematics, which has input factor of zero. And actually, they have input factor of zero, I think, because it's just to, mainly to publish proceeding on conference. It has been cited as of today, 8,500 times. <laughs> so you know that uh, this one is actually a good paper because it's not the citation is not for the input factor. But let's go quickly to the videos. It was part of the supplementary material of the three half paper. This is the same variable, but like tau and two tau. And the same variable of the. So here, the many vectors, the components are successive values of the x variable. This is the original one with the three variables taken from the equation, once you have the numerical integration. And this is the reconstructed one. And you take the successive values of the x variable. Okay, the, the, the important thing is that there is equivalence, uh, one to one, sorry, a one to one. Is a one to one uh, correspondence between the original and the retrospective state space. This is called uh, mathematically the geomorphism. Uh, so that we can reconstruct the state space from the time series and 
the structure director, the machine director, under certain conditions that I will show you quickly now, uh, are equivalent. Okay? Uh, one good thing is that uh, once we have the city space, we can look at the generalized synchronization, the synchronization indices we have it without the need of filtering the data. So if we have uh, any type of nonlinear uh, synchronization or coupling in the original scheme, you don't need you can preserve uh, this uh, coupling uh, in the reconstructed space space using the time series and then it's always uh, a very important benefit if you don't have to filter the data. For the reconstruction to be equivalent you have to fulfill certain pro uh, properties. First the time series should be infinite and noise free. Any two components of the original vector should be independent and the size of the vector, the number of components should be greater than twice the dimension of the original system plus one. This is a very difficult condition to uh, fulfill in practice, but later on a very interesting work uh, called in biology from Sauer et al. in physics, the general strategy of physics in 1981, relies on this condition in a bit, so that they set for a, a very small set of points in the attractor, you can go back to m approximately equal to d, and you don't need complete independence between the components, but almost independent. Even so, the system is relatively. If we have the time series which is relatively normal, you can reconstruct the effect. But still, you have a practical problem how to calculate tau or n, just to get that the two components are independent. You need to have uh, tau which is high enough. Do you normally use the self-mutual information or the autocorrelation function as a function of time? Here you have the, an example for a human EEG in the sleep during the stage 3. And in both cases you see the vertical red line that approximately a value of 12 would be enough to get values of the signal which are approximately independent from each other. In the case of uh, M, we have to use a heuristic approach which is called the fast nearest neighbor method that I will explain you quickly. Suppose we have that the original uh, state is two-dimensional two and you have three states, the green, the red and the blue one. As you will see in the original state, the green and the red and the blue are actually quite well separated because, because the green one is here and the red and the blue one is here. If you try to reproduce or reconstruct this state space using a one-dimensional approach, red and blue are more or less in the same, at the same position, but the green due to the uh, insufficient dimension of the reconstruction is well become, becomes a uh, close neighbor of the red and the blue, right? So, but this is actually a false neighbor because if I go to a higher dimension, these two remain as close neighbor, but this one is no longer uh, such a close neighbor. So, uh, we can just increase the uh, dimension of the reconstruction and look at the proportion of false news neighbor that we have in our data. So here is an example. Uh, blue is for Lawrence and Hanon is red. Hanon is actual dimension is two. Uh, Lawrence actual dimension is uh, three. And even if you contamine with noise, if you go for values higher than three or four, you will see the proportion of uh, or the fraction of mm, uh, false neighbor that st stop being neighbors when you increase M goes to zero, so you can say that M equal to 4 is a good reconstruction, right? Very quickly, just to show you what is actually an embedding vector is nothing but a time pattern. Here you have this reference vector is like a time pattern. You have x, x plus you know, minus tau, minus 2 tau, 3 tau, and so on. And what are the nearest neighbor? Nearest neighbor here in uh, red, you'll find that the, the most similar patterns are of the time, the, the time series, right? And uh, this is the reference vector is here. These are the true neighbors. The true neighbors uh, here indicate what are the mutual neighbors of Y. So if you compare uh, this one with this, we'll have uh, this uh, size of the ring. Uh, cycle and here we will have the thing cycle. We can compare whether this vector here is uh, sorry, this vector here are similar to this or this vector here are similar to this. Okay. The only uh, 
thing we have to be careful is that the value of gray, the number of uh, neighbors we use for the analysis has to be greater than n. I'm just finishing. Uh, but I would like to talk briefly about this. Uh, one problem is that <coughs> any given GS index whose value is higher than but close to zero, it is sometimes difficult to be sure uh, that this is measuring actually synchronization because if the time sheet is too short, then the value is higher than zero and uh, it might not be because of the uh, coupling but because of the shortness of the time sheet, right? Uh, an elegant solution is the making use of bivariate surrogate series, which works as follows. You first construct a set of p bivariate time series, which share with the original one most of the properties, but are partially or completely independent from each other. Right? You know that these time series are independent. Then you compare the, the value of the index in the original, it's called G0, with the distribution for the surrogates. This one you know that it is compatible with the null hypothesis that they are all independent, and then you compare the original with the ensemble of the surrogates. If they are, if this one belongs to this distribution, then clearly you cannot say that there are some, there is a, a coupling. But if this original value does not belong to this distribution, then you have a good reason to claim at a certain level of statistical significance that uh, there is some kind of interdependence affecting the value of this U. Main difficulties are to produce the surrogates and to use appro appropriate statistical tests. This is a full uh, field of research, and if any of you is interested, we can <coughs> speak later on. And uh, there are many approaches to construct surrogates. The simplest one is just to go take the value of the time series and soften them completely so that any uh, correlation with the other signal is completely lost. In this way, you preserve the uh, amplitude distribution <coughs> of the original time series, but you lose <coughs> any uh, correlation time series, so it's uh, not the perfect surrogate, but there are more complex ways to produce uh, this kind of surrogates. And then just to, how can you test or compare the original with the surrogate values? There are many ways. Uh, you can use parametric or non-parametric tests, depending basically on whether this distribution is Gaussian or not. Uh, and also it has been suggested to take a uh, modified value of the index by subtracting the average of the surrogates from the original and taking this as an ambiguous measure of the synchronization uh, recently in the literature. I'll give you a quick example. This one is from EEG from human uh, neonates. This is the original. Here we have surrogate one of the time series, and here we have surrogate two of the time series, preserving the linear correlation, but uh, eliminating the nonlinear one, which is possible to do. This is the original value. This is corresponding to B, and this corresponds to C. As you can see, there's a big difference between this and this, which indicates that actually the index is measuring uh, some degree of correlation. But if you compare this and this, it's much more difficult to say whether there are differences. So it seems that there are there is a certain kind of uh, correlation or interdependence, <coughs> but this seems to be mainly. Well, and just to finalize, uh, this is a problem which is a very interesting one, and also this is very recent. One important problem is that what happens if we have more than two time series, more than two uh, dynamical systems? Uh, we can have this typical configuration where x, y affects x2 and x2 affects x3. If we uh, look for or measure one of these indexes we have seen, we will find that there is also some degree of correlation between or interdependence or however you can call it between x1 and x3 because x3 has information about x1 due to x2, right? So this is a kind of indirect or spurious connection which is actually not there in the equations but appear if you look at the time series. We would like to derive an index which is able to look at these things and being uh, able to remove any direct connectivity by being sure that all connections between two systems are or is direct. Right? This is, we can't want to use uh, what is called a conditioned or a partialized uh, index of synchronization where the influence of the rest of the time series is removed. It's uh, very important if you have uh, more than two systems, which is uh, 
very uh, used one, right? Uh, examples of these types, you have granular causality, which you can use in a, in a linear um, uh, framework, or partial transfer entropy, but it is quite costly to estimate. Well, there has been uh, an effort in the literature to produce an index uh, which is able to do what we have seen using the embedded vectors. And I will show you quickly how it works, so it's a little bit late. Well, they use mix embedding. How is mix embedding? We construct the future vector of y. You just one, two, up to t steps ahead. Usually we take t equal to one, right? We select delays for x and y and construct a big vector. We have all the past state of t up to a delay of lx and all the past state states <coughs> of y up to a del uh, delay of ly. You can take, this one can be equal or unequal, you have flexibility. You start with an entity vector, and in the first embedded cycle, you calculate the mutual information between any of these individual <coughs> components and the future of one. And you pick up <coughs> from all the components the one which has the highest information about the future, which is the arc maximum. It's written here in the formal way, right? You pick up the one with the highest information and put it in your box, your basket, right? Like when you are in Amazon. Then you do the same. Go for the second one and pick up the one from the remaining ones <coughs> that has the highest information, condition it, and this is the interesting thing, to the information you already have. You only pick up uh, the new component if it is providing additional information. If it is not providing any additional information, and you can just uh, calculate it by doing this uh, ratio between information you already have and the new information you have. Uh, if it is not providing additional information, then you stop taking new components, and then you get an app with a vector which might have components from x, y, or both. That is why it is called mixed embedding, because you have information from both x and y. Right. And then you can define an index uh, in which you compare the information about y, which is given by x, and it is not present in y, this is how you read it, by the total information which is available about y. And if it is zero, if you don't have information in x about y, and it is close to one if you can predict uh, or you have complete information about y, uh, about x in, uh, about y in x. I mean, in this way it is still not partialized, but you can quickly extend it by adding all the possible components you have, repeat all the procedure, and then partialize here with regard to all the other components, so that you will have all the information about y, which is in x, and not in z, so that the directionality I will show you an example of a configuration with a Heron, five Heron maps connected in this way. Uh, this is the true connectivity matrix, and this is the different indexes. This is a granular causality, transfer entropy, uh, the first index without partializing, conditional granular causality, partial transfer entropy, and um, partial uh, mix, mutual information with mixed embedding. And you'll see this one is the one which is closest to the original uh, connectivity matrix, and if you refer, for instance, to the gra conditional granular causality, uh, since the coupling is non-linear, uh, you will see that this has nothing to do with it. So it seems that it works very well in practice. Uh, just a quick sample of publishing pros. Uh, recent application during music improvisation, the authors claim that only this uh, strategy was able to identify correctly the pattern of cause and interdependence, comparing the brain of a pianist and a listener where they were composing or improvising music. Uh, this is known from the literature that uh, are the areas which are involved and it is correctly identified using this uh, MIMA, but it is not if you use some of the other methods. And even if you compare uh, between the two conditions, uh, only mine indicate that in listener the pattern of different between conditions was more widespread than in the pattern. 
So to the conclusion, you can say that synchronization is an universal concept playing a central role in many scientific disciplines, especially neuroscience and other things. General synchronization is a very general, general type of synchronization that might appear even between two non-identical non-linear dynamical systems. And its fingerprint is the closeness of simultaneous state vector in both state spaces. X and Y. Tagging theorems allows us, uh, under related general condition, to reconstruct the state space from the time series. And uh, if we uh, use these two things, the fingerprint and the reconstruction, uh, we can assess general synchronization from time series in the reconstructed state space. Right. Uh, and I will end with this place. It is possible right now to assess complex causal relationship between experimental variables, even in multivariate setups. Anyways, um, thank you very much. Sorry for standing. Ten more minutes. <laughs>
not exactly parametric, I mean with granular causality you, can, you will have the, the parametric distribution on the certain condition. And there are like this new uh, method published in science in 2011 from Russia, which is called maximum information coefficient, which depends only on the uh, rank of the value, then you, you, the size of the, of the time series, and then you will have a kind of, not exactly, but it's quite uh, approximate, uh, quick, uh, uh, quite uh, similar to a parametric version, so you will have a p-value associated to each uh, value of the index, uh, that mm, gives you an idea of the probability that, that there, are, there is a uh, uh, synchronization or correlation uh, in a statistical sense. But this, for instance, this index is not uh, not able to disentangle direct from indirect relations. Yeah. Would, you, would you think that there is a method which is already sufficiently sensitive to detect asymmetric bidirectional correlations? I think the L1 is good. L1 is good. It's a clever idea from from an It's very clever because this normalizing. I mean, you, you need to invest a little bit more time so because you have to show it. So you provide uh, the, the index in supplementary material. We have our work on the method that we have managed to speed up the calculation. We have to make uh, some testing and it seems to work well. The problem is that it does not distinguish between direct and indirect. And this P-mine, it seems also to work relatively good. And this is better than direct or stuff. The problem then, partial transfer entropy is also good. The problem is that you have to estimate a lot of parameters because you need. Uh, but there are, I mean, I was very quick on this story because I, was, I didn't realize that I have spent so much time. Possibly I talk too much. Uh, but there has been a couple of interesting works recently. This one from Druje et al., this group of, group of course, they derived <coughs> a method which is called uh, Momentary Information Transfer, I think it's called MIT. MIT. <laughs> <laughs> And it's been, it's been applied to um, whether this, this is the study of uh, climate uh, to try to understand the influence of El Nino on the, um, the weather all around the world. And uh, they use a similar idea, this uh, concept of trying to reduce the dimension by taking into account only the components that actually provide information by first trying to see whether they actually provide any information and then put, it, put them into the calculation of the index. And again, they have recently, uh, this, this in Italian, they have produced an estimation of partial transfer entropy using mm, conditional entropies, uh, which also aims at reducing the dimensionality for the calculation of partial transfer entropy, which also seems to work relatively good uh, and give similar results to uh, traditional estimation of PDA. But I like this one, this PMI. It uh, seems to work very well. Any other question? Or if not, thanks again. Thank you very much.